under pressure. How the boost to boost could increase strain on the NHS. Health workers fear the extra work involved in delivering the jab will mean other crucial services could suffer. If we're going to deliver up boosters, then we need to know what we have to stop doing because we've got a day job to do. Also coming up in the programme. Festive cheer in Downing Street tonight, but awkward questions for the PM over claims he hosted a party there last Christmas when all gatherings were banned. Does the Prime Minister really expect the country to believe that while people were banned from seeing their loved ones at Christmas last year, it was fine for him and his friends to throw a boozy party in Downing Street? After Arwen, tens of thousands still without power, a week on from the storm that battered northern Britain. And... Mm, a bleak winter indeed, but could this carol warm hearts and top the charts this Christmas? You are watching On Demand. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. There are warnings tonight of huge pressures threatening the NHS as it accelerates the COVID booster vaccine programme to fight the Omicron variant. One of the government's top scientific advisers has told IDV News that the measures against Omicron should be even tougher than those that have already been put in place. Well, latest figures show there are nine new Omicron cases in England and another one in Scotland, bringing the total of confirmed Omicron infections in the UK to 32. In the last 24 hours, another 48,374 cases of coronavirus infections have been reported and another 171 deaths. Our health editor, Emily Morgan, reports. We were asked to roll up our sleeves and join the national effort. That message appears to have been taken seriously here in Eastleigh, where this church has been converted into a vaccine centre and was heaving. The last two days since the announcements were made, it's been really, really busy and we've had lots of people walking in and trying to get a vaccination on the off chance. Surgeries will have to help deliver the massive booster campaign, which will offer every adult a jab by the end of January. But many GPs can't see how on earth they'll do it. If we're going to deliver up boosters, then we need to know what we have to stop doing because we've got a day job to do. That work doesn't go away. Those people that we would then not be seeing in those few weeks will still need to be seen. So it, it just pushes the problem further down the road. So patient care is going to suffer? Potentially, yes, unless ex ex extensive workforce is found quite quickly because we can't do it all. And that is the worry. This is a service that is already almost at breaking point, and it's not just here in primary care, but in hospitals too, just at a time when they're desperately trying to clear the backlog, their focus now has to turn to the booster campaign. The government does at least acknowledge they're asking a lot. Now we're asking them to do a lot more through the step up in the national vaccination programme. I know that they're up to it, but we want to make sure they're provided with all the support that's needed. That includes the volunteers, the 500 or so personnel we're getting help from in terms of the military personnel. But it's about all of us working together. Concern has deepened, though, as it emerged a key group of scientists who advised the government warned last week the introduction of the Omicron variant would likely be capable of initiating a new wave of infections. They go on, we cannot exclude that this wave would be of a magnitude similar or even larger than previous waves. One member of that advisory group, speaking in a personal capacity, told me he's pretty clear about how to prepare for it. We would say that we need to put in place additional precautions and would advise against the large indoor gatherings, particularly under noisy circumstances or in poorly ventilated areas. So you would suggest that things like Christmas parties and big family gatherings or social gatherings are cancelled? I think many of us feel that we wouldn't feel safe to go ahead with large Christmas parties. Tonight in Downing Street, amid the confusion about whether parties should be on or off, the government stood firm. 
Don't cancel them, but take a test beforehand just to be safe. Emily Morgan, ITV News. So, while millions of us are turning our thoughts to whether it's safe to attend a Christmas party or not this year, it was a Christmas party last year that caused a commotion in the Commons today. Sikir Starmer accused Boris Johnson's government of breaking Covid rules during a Downing Street function in December 2020. He read out those rules during Prime Minister's questions. You must not have a work Christmas lunch or party. Does the Prime Minister really expect the country to believe that while people were banned from seeing their loved ones at Christmas last year, it was fine for him and his friends to throw a boozy party in Downing Street? Mr Speaker, uh, what I can tell the right honourable gentleman is that, uh, is that all guidance was followed uh, completely. Well, let's see what our political editor, Robert Peston, makes of all this. He's preparing for his programme in West London. Robert, this is perplexing, isn't it? The Prime Minister didn't deny a party was held, but he insists that no rules were broken. How can that be? Well, look, my sources tell me there was a party. Uh, and as you say, the Prime Minister's response is, to put it mildly, intriguing. I mean, the statement from his spokesman was that uh, the spokesman didn't recognise the version of events, of events put forward by the Mirror newspaper, which first disclosed this party on December the 18th. Now, you know, work gatherings were allowed, uh, but if, you know, booze was partaken and, you know, there were games and, you know, so I am told that it was a sort of proper party in that sense, quite difficult to know uh, how that met the rules. But let's just say that in some legalistic sense it was OK. It certainly, I think, breached the spirit of what most of the rest of us thought was allowed at that time, and that is a problem for the Prime Minister, simply because there is a sort of, you know, growing trend, uh, some would say, of this government deciding that rules that it has written um, don't completely apply to its own behaviour. Uh, you know, we saw that with, you know, the 24 hours that it took for the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, was actually on my programme later to quit, um, you know, after he breached the social distancing rules that he'd written. There's the famous, you know, Barnard Castle uh, incident as well. So, in general, um, this, this, this issue of whether the government follows the rules properly is a real one, and there's a by-election on Thursday where, you know, we'll see how much that's damaged Boris Johnson's popularity. OK, Robert Person in West London, thank you. Police say they are treating as murder the death of a schoolgirl whose body was discovered in a park in South Lanarkshire. Amber Gibson, who was 16, had been reported missing after leaving her home in the town of Hamilton last Friday evening. Her body was found two days later. Anna Miller reports from Hamilton. Amber Gibson, sometimes known as Amber Niven, wasn't doing anything different to any other 16-year-old on the night she went missing, according to police who are now investigating her murder. A 16-year-old uh, death is absolutely tragic and certainly one is, is from a homicide, so our focus is to understand Amber's last movement so that we can provide some answers to her loved ones. Amber was reported missing from the town of Hamilton just before 10pm on Friday. She was last seen on Cadso Street after leaving home in the Hill House area around 9.15 that night. On Sunday morning, just after 10am, emergency services were alerted to a body near Cadso Glen. The next day, police formally identified the body as the missing teenager. Her death was being treated as unexplained before a murder investigation was launched on Tuesday. The park remained sealed off today, the investigation happening in the shadow of a residential street. Just utterly shocked, really can't believe it. It's far too close to home, it's really frightening. It's a worry that girls, especially young girls, can't walk about at night time without things like this happening to them. Police say a key part of their investigation is to establish whether Amber knew her attacker as they try to work out what happened in the hours leading up to the death of a 16-year-old girl who had her whole future in front of her. 
Well, Amber's family and loved ones are, as you'd expect, said to be devastated by her death. And people who live here are left with a lot of questions as police try to reassure them in the absence of any arrests. This park is less than a 10-minute walk from Hamilton Town Centre, which they say would have been very busy at the time she was last seen. Just the smallest detail could help them move this investigation forward. Hannah Miller in Hamilton, thank you. Now, five days after the destructive might of Storm Arwen left a trail of chaos across northern England and Scotland, thousands of people are desperately hoping their power will be restored soon. Around 30,000 homes are still without electricity. Sangeeta Lal's report begins in Aberdeenshire. Dressed for the outdoors because it's just as cold inside her home. This is the only way Jade can have hot water and the only way to keep her baby warm. Preparing for a sixth night without power, it's not just the cold keeping her awake at night. It's been awful and it's made me feel just so guilty as a parent that, you know, I can't provide my kids with warmth and with hot food. They're coming down in the morning and it's pitch black and they're cold and I've got to run around getting the fire and everything stoked. I'm throwing blankets and jackets over them to keep them warm, trying to get the baby warm and that. It's just made me feel desperate. The storm hit five days ago, but it was one of the worst in decades. Gale force winds and heavy snow have left thousands without power. This hospice in Northumberland is managing to run on a generator, but even that may run out soon. Our fear is that the generator um, you know, breaks down, packs up, and then we, would, uh, we really would be in trouble. All anyone wants to know is when they'll be reconnected. Today in the House of Commons, the business secretary was asked if the problems could last till Christmas. The isolated communities point is something which I take extremely seriously. Being without power until Christmas is simply unacceptable. And it's not just homes, but businesses that are affected too. After closing because of the pandemic, now it's because they have no power. Inside my stock, preparation food, everything, I'm throwing them away, it's clear the fridge, everything has to be gone. It's some of the worst hit and most remote areas now, though, that still have to wait as they brace for another night of freezing temperatures. Sangi Talal, ITV News, Blanchland. Now, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has agreed to change the government's new crime legislation so that domestic abuse and sexual offences will be treated as seriously as knife crime and murder. ITB News revealed today that the policing bill will be amended to explicitly include these as crimes of serious violence. And our Deputy Political Editor, Anushka Astana, is in West London. Anushka, this is really significant, isn't it? Well, to the domestic abuse campaigners who I've been speaking to for some time and to politicians like the Conservative peer Gabby Burton and Labour's Jess Phillips, I think it is really significant because they had big worries that that new duty on local agencies, including the police, to tackle violent crime didn't make explicit that these offences should be included. There was only a short list. Ministers said they wanted to allow for regional variations. But what campaigners say to me is there is no regional variation when it comes to domestic abuse and sexual violence. These crimes are everywhere and there's also evidence that they're not being treated seriously enough in a lot of areas. For example, only eight out of 18 violence reduction units in England actually include these crimes in their strategies. The government's own document on how to tackle violent crime drawn up in 2018 doesn't include them either. So the hope is that by making them explicit in this bill, by telling local agencies, including the police, you must tackle this as part of your strategies, that that could start to change the way that they are being responded to in different parts of the country. Anuska Ashtana in uh, West London, thank you. And the cross-examination began today of the youngest alleged victim in the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell on sex abuse charges. The witness, known only by the pseudonym Jane, denied inventing her alleged abuse. Our US correspondent Emma Murphy is in New York. So, Emma, what evidence has been heard today? Well, we've heard today from the defence who are seeking to dis discredit the prosecution's key witness. And it was a really blistering morning in the court. They started by trying to bring out the contradictions in statements that Jane made to the authorities over two years ago. 
Yesterday, she was asked whether or not she had been sexually abused by Glenn Maxwell. She said yes, she had. But the um, defence then drew on statements that she'd made to the FBI that said she didn't recall that. She was asked yesterday whether or not Glenn Maxwell had been present when Jane had been sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein. Yesterday, she said yes, she had. In previous statements, she said no, she didn't remember. There was also one interesting point when she was asked about the first trip she ever took with the pair. She said that she was 14 years old and she had flown to New York with them in order to watch The Lion King. It was then pointed out to her that The Lion King didn't open until 1997 when she was 17. And of course it wouldn't be this case if there was not the mention of a famous name or two. Today we heard that um, the court was told she was just 14 when Jane was taken in a green car to Mar-a-Lago to be introduced to Donald Trump and that when she was still a teenager she flew on the so-called Lolita Express, Epstein's jet, with Prince Andrew. Emma Murphy in New York, thank you. So to come on the ITV Evening News, the crisis in nursery care and the disruption to children's lives. Plus... It's that time again, the race for Christmas number one, why a carol could just burst the pop bubble. First, the government today described its 10-year plan for reforming adult social care in England as ambitious. Labour, though, called it woefully short of the mark. The proposals published today are aimed at enabling older and disabled people to live in their own homes for longer. But as our UK editor Paul Brand reports, critics say the priority should be solving the care industry's staffing crisis. Sylvia is living with cancer. Her daughter Sue has it as well. Yet she must also care for her disabled dad, Barry. The family share just a small flat and the constant need for care. It is hard. It's hard for her. And it shouldn't be. And I've just got nowhere to go. I'm just stuck in you. As I say, I'm here 24-7. I don't go out. When's he last get a break? Last, I got a break. I was in hospital two weeks ago. That was a break? <laughs> yeah, that was a break for me. Yeah. To give everyone a break, the home Hi. requires a list of adaptations almost as long as their list of medications. Because he has got an electric chair, but he can't use it because it's too, too big to use in the flat. You just need a bit more space, yeah, don't you? Yeah, more space, yeah. And everything lowered. And... Yeah, yeah. Today, the government announced more money to help with that as part of a long-promised plan to reform care. It includes £300 million for better housing, £150 million to improve technology and £500 million for staff, though that part has previously been announced. What today's adult social care white paper is about is setting out a 10-year vision for world-beating adult social care reform with uh, control and choice and support at its heart. But the vision for the future does little to help with the unprecedented staffing crisis care is seeing now. We last filmed with Christine in September. These carers are all, you know, shattered. We need help. She doesn't feel she's got it today. I'd like to take the government that sits in Parliament out with us and see what they can see out there, what we're actually up against. You don't think they've been listening? No, not at all. Then in the evening, we've got that full run to cover. Back at headquarters, her company currently has 120 vacancies. They do not expect today's plan to fill them. If I'm honest, I was hoping for something a bit more radical. Um, and what we've heard so far, I've obviously I haven't seen the detail of it, there's a bit of money, but if you look at the sums, they're not transformational. To better staff the sector, the real reform needed is to wages. Without more investment, it is the vulnerable who'll pay the price. Paul Brand, ITV News, Somerset. 
Well, as well as the major issues around the care of people as they get older, provisions for those at the other end of life are also under the spotlight today. Research shared exclusively with ITV News suggests that staff shortages, underfunding and low pay are causing growing disruption to childcare services in England. Now, the Early Years Alliance survey found that 84% of childcare providers had difficulty recruiting staff. Almost two-thirds had staff who'd resigned in the last six months, with more than half of those considering leaving blaming poor pay. And that has forced almost half of providers to limit numbers or indeed stop taking on new children. Rupert Evelyn reports. They are our future, starting their educational journey at nursery or preschool. Vulnerable not just due to age, but because of a growing and serious shortage of staff. Windmill Hill City Farm is in the heart of Bristol, but despite its location and the number of potential staff living in the catchment area, it's struggling. We want to offer a level of care. We're not just storing bikes for the day, it's, these are children, and it's important to fund that properly. A couple of weeks ago, we had to close this service of farm adventurers down because we got somebody on leave, we had a couple of people call in sick, and then we're left with one member of staff, and we just can't open the service. Funding is the issue. It's said the government money doesn't cover the costs, and with higher incomes available to staff in other sectors, Parents argue that those they trust with their children are worth more. These professionals are doing an amazing job with children and they should be very well paid. And if there's no resources in there, people will, will not want to work in this. We don't really value childcare enough. You know, these people are do a fantastic job looking after our precious little babies that we need to make sure they're valued and paid well and, and supported. Rural Somerset. And despite the change of location, the problems are the same. The government say they've not seen any councils reporting supply issues and are increasing hourly rates to childcare providers. But on the ground, they disagree. Recruiting um, trained staff that know how to deal with children with autism or children that have undergone trauma, like the collective trauma of COVID, uh, who understand child development, is very, very difficult, which means for the first time in 10 years, we're finding it hard to meet the needs of our children with additional needs. There are calls for the government to create a salary structure for the sector similar to that for teachers. Without it, it's claimed parents and children face increasing disruption and uncertainty when they need it least. Rupert Evelyn, ITV News, Somerset. Britain's former tennis number one, Jana Conta, announced her retirement from the sport today. Ms Conta, who's 30, reached three Grand Slam semi-finals, her most recent, the French Open, in 2019. And finally, the race to clinch this year's coveted Christmas number one has been seen as a contest between big stars like Lad Baby, Adele, or Sir Elton John, to name but three. But now a much-loved Christmas carol written 150 years ago has emerged as a surprise contender. Yasmin Bodleby reports. <laughs> Not your typical chart topper. But you can't fault its Christmas credentials. This is the Church of England's first ever bid for Christmas number one. A new version of In the Bleak Midwinter. It's about connecting back to our communities and the stuff that's really at the heart of Christmas, which I think is what we're all hoping for this year. Um, so everything from this is going to be donated to charity. But it won't be easy. It'll be up against big hitters like Adele and the power duo of Ed Sheeran and Elton John. Social media star Lad Baby has topped the Christmas charts for three years in a row singing about less celestial things, like sausage rolls. Could the choir stop them all? They've got a chance, uh, but if we're entirely honest, and certainly the betting suggests it's between the, the, sort of, the so-called big two, Ed Sheeran with Elton John versus Lad Baby. But it all depends on what punters think. He falls <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really nice, I like it so much, yeah. I don't think it's going to be Christmas number one. 
It is actually very nice. And it deserves to be there, yeah, if it's for a good cause. Um, but yeah, it will have <laughs> it will have competition from the sausage roll song. It's a slow burner and there are no sausage rolls. But the feeling on the street is that it could just do it. Yasmin Bottleby, ITV News. And that is all for now. Raggy's here with news at 10, but from me and all the evening news team, bye-bye.